Emergency with service. Hold the line, please. Hello. I cannot release your line until you say that you do not need an emergency service. Northern Ireland's 999 Emergency Call Centre. It deals with people across the UK. One day in April, staff here dealt with more than 100,000 calls. Hello, can you hear me? Do you need fire? Police. Or ambulance. The call for coronavirus. The vast majority of calls directly related to COVID are for the ambulance service. But all the emergency services have been impacted by the virus. And Spotlight has been given exclusive access to their teams as they work through the crisis. Hello caller, do you need fire please sir? Ambulance, is a call about coronavirus? Ambulance, thank you. Jessica Willis and Orla McCartney are starting their day's work at their East Belfast base. They're part of a team of just over a thousand ambulance staff that have been driving through the coronavirus storm for the last months. Bizarre, definitely, yeah. I mean, you have the normal day-to-day -day kind of patients that you expect and then obviously you have this new threat of COVID with you as well. <coughs> you don't really know what you're going to be going to any day, so um, nothing's really changed there. The ambulance service is in the front line in the battle to contain the impact of COVID-19. The crews have dealt with more than 13,000 COVID calls since the start of the crisis. You have to enjoy it because of all the pressure you're under and the things that you're seeing and the crewmates that you're stuck with. Cheers. 999 mode activated. That means, hold on, Jessica's driving like a mad woman. They crisscross Belfast and its suburbs. Female, recent discharge from hospital, very chest sepsis. mode activated. The coronavirus has affected just about every element of their work, especially the precautions to protect themselves and patients. Love a bit of dressing up, Papa. Hard to get used to. Huh? It was hard to get used to. I in the beginning. Now I can't imagine going on a new home without them. You happy enough if I have a listen to your chest here, Betty? Just you sit back and relax and take nice deep breaths for me. So observation wise, how like everything's good with ourselves, okay? Good. But no. just with your bloods having been taken and the doctor noticing those little indicators yes. between your troponin and your infection levels. Uh -huh. We'll have to take you down to the hospital then. Uh -huh. Okay, so is there anything you want to bring with you? Have you a wee mobile phone hey, that you can, a wee bag, keys, whatever we need? Did you just watch this chair because it doesn't have arms on it, Hetty. It. Yep. It's quite low. Do you want to hold on to me while you're sitting down? And you just square yourself off there. After a routine call, they've seen signs of COVID. Not for the first time today, they need to take all precautions until the patient is tested. Even the paperwork from calls like this gets special treatment and is written up away from the patient. Paperwork has to be kept clean. Um, obviously, it's, if it's with the patient in the back of the vehicle, um, you're going to have cross-contamination. Then that can be passed on in the hospital. Yeah, that's a very straightforward example of what's happening now. It was a routine call to someone who was, who was under pressure and the doctor wanted the patient taken to the Royal. But when the ambulance crew came, they realized that the patient was showing symptoms of COVID-19 
So suddenly the whole dynamic changes, their way of operating changes. Well, they're now taking the patient instead of to the Royal, to the Mater. COVID-related treatment in Belfast is centred at the Mater Hospital. Later, in the shadow of the old Crumlin Road jail, the ambulance gets special treatment of its own. Now, what's going on here behind us? Can you tell us what, what is going on here? So, because we brought that last patient into the matter as a potential COVID case, what the matter now has is a cleaning team up here. So, after any potential COVID case, we have to bring the vehicle up to get cleaned out, and these guys do it for us. It is, it is extraordinary, isn't it, the knock-on impact of... It is, because this is a further 20 minutes, 30 minutes that we're now off the road as well. So pretty much every day, presumably, when you're on shift, at some point you're going to get a COVID-19 patient or somebody with symptoms. Potentially after every call, yeah. Does that bring any kind of extra anxiety for you, or do you just, at this stage, just deal with it? I think at the moment you just have to deal with it, because it's the majority of calls now. One from senior management, just there's a lot of calls of concern in relation to scramblers and quads and around the Glenside Road. The police have created special COVID teams equipped to deal with situations where the virus could pose an extra threat. This team, based in Lisburn, is led tonight by Gavin. No issues with their masks, the JSP masks. Everybody's just working, functioning okay. Yeah. Spoken to the off-going sergeant, they have sanitised the vehicles. and need to go back out and do that again, just for our own reassurance. Kevin, can I ask you, how's it been? How, what's it like working in these conditions? Um, different. You can't really plan for it. You can't really make any arrangements, be it in work or outside of work. It's a bit difficult for home, I suppose. Um, I have a, a young... We fell these two there, so sort of this year, at the start of this year, before all this happened, we were making arrangements for his birthday party and having family around, and there was family coming from Australia and different things. Um, and obviously they're now not able to to come, so it's sort of time that you'll not get back with them. Yeah. A set of glasses, really, just for if there was if you get a violent prisoner and they're spitting or or not even spitting so much, if they're just exasperated or breathing heavily, that apparently that's enough to transfer the virus as well. So keep it out of your eyes. Keep it out of your eyes, yeah. So when I get a COVID call, that's what you're wearing. As much as a lot of the kits for our protection, it's also that if we go into the likes of a care home or something like that, we have to be mindful we might be bringing something into them. The COVID units across Northern Ireland have been called on more than 500 times. That's less than had been planned for. There's been a drop of around 30% in reported crime during the lockdown. The reports of domestic violence have increased by 12%. Tonight, we follow Gavin's team as they investigate reports of antisocial behaviour. What's your name, young man? They've broken just a few windows, just a large number of kids gathering and broken some windows. So. Three-year police veteran Danielle think? fills us in. Sorted. There's just a few kids in there been sent on now, so the details are noted and we'll contact their mum and dads about it. Run of the mill policing on one side, doesn't it? Keeping yeah. an eye on kids. Especially coming into the summer. And then you've got social distancing though, which clearly they weren't observing, yeah. But they seemed all, you know, happy enough that once you sort of explained to them, will you go home for me, do you mind, stand apart? So they're all, they don't it's seem like, enough, don't right? seem like bad kids really, just looking for something to do in the summer, so that's really it. The lockdown coinciding with hot weather left a lot of young people with little to do. Some confused vandalism with entertainment. Over recent weeks now, I suppose with the schools being off, there's been lots of complaints of antisocial behaviour. There was actually an arson here. Was it a few nights ago, Gavin? Um, last week, this time last, last week. Last week, yeah. Where we believe it was kids, obviously, had set it alight. The threat of attack from dissident Republicans explains why most of the patrol won't show their faces. But now they've also got COVID-19 to think about. I think it's just another thing you have to think about in the back of your mind and you have to sort of plan, you know, for it. Um, I think the best way to do it is to act like you have it. And when you're speaking to other people, give them the space and 
because you wouldn't want to pass it on to somebody, you know, when you're engaging and speaking to them. So, yeah, I think you're definitely more mindful of washing your hands and washing the police cars down and stuff like that. And yeah. All seems reasonably quiet. I'm sure now I've said that, well, things will change, so it's the key word. Just like that. <laughs> this is a call about coronavirus. Hold the line, please. Emergency, word service. Need fire. The fire service faced its own challenges during the pandemic. One scenario imagined losing up to 60% of firefighters due to COVID-19. Instead, it has been able to maintain a full complement at every station. And they were needed, as lockdown saw a spike in domestic fires by as much as 50% at one point. These have now fallen to normal levels, but the same can't be said for outbreaks of gorse fires. Today, we're on our way to a fire on the outskirts of Castle Wellen in County Down. It's been burning for almost 24 hours. The lead officer for wildfires, Commander Mark Smith, is heading to a briefing on the situation. In terms of resourcing that we have here, there's the fire burning on the hill at the ridge that you can see, and it's actually burning up in behind that, and then in a horseshoe shape towards the, the tree line behind it. You can tell, they, Annie? Yeah, that's okay. Water is being pumped up from Castle Wellen Lake to the fire, more than half a mile away, high up the hillside. In a fire, I guess, only water puts it out, Dara. We can't beat this out. Drones operated by a specialist support charity, Skywatch, use thermal image cameras to identify the hot spots. So we're seeing that there's a couple of jets on there and they're making a big difference to that. In fact, in the last two minutes, they've put that hot spot out. And what sort of distance are we away from that at the moment? We're Let's do that first. 313 metres. From here? From here, yeah. Brilliant. In that direction. Yeah. There. There's forward a wee bit. Okay, so yeah. that's our crews there then. You see the crews actually working there? Yeah. So as you come up, this field here, you can see the smoke getting very thick. You can really smell it now. The fire seems to be burning mostly just over that ridge. We're going to see how close we can get safely. Most of the firefighters here are volunteers with other full-time jobs. Today they are trying to save acres of valuable trees and lumber managed by the Forestry Service. You can see the damage here. Here is where sometimes the mistake can be made. The issue for me here is if we don't put these smaller bits out, they burn deep. It takes an awful lot of water to penetrate. No. I'm just looking around here, you can see that there's been an awful lot of fire. Yes. So uh, I presume it was pretty crazy at one point. It's pretty crazy if you just flashed up into the trees and followed the tree line on up over, which we had a retreat out of, because the smoke was just so thick and heavy we couldn't work on it for our own safety. So it was. You're safe now, though. Yes. And stay safe, guys. Thank you. You can really see the damage the fire has caused here. The smoke's still coming up, just about obscuring the Irish Sea over there, Castle Well and Lake below. But the mountains of Morn, well, the smoke hasn't managed to dim them too much. You can still make them out. How many wildfires have you seen in the last little while? Well, over the month of April, uh, we have seen uh, more than 500 gorse type fires, uh, vegetation fires across the whole country. Probably our busiest April for many, many years. That's down to weather. Um, and it's down to then, because the weather's so good, then we have lots of people out burning, controlling land. The number of fires appear linked to pandemic restrictions. When waste collection centres were closed, some people dumped and burned their rubbish. 
We have had some fly tipping down in the Yoma area. A couple of our fires that were started by people fly tipping and, and burning, the, burning it and then it getting out of control. But also then we have others who are out just determined to, to be what we call countryside vandals. And during this time when we as a fire service are trying to keep social distancing for our firefighters, we do not need to be standing beside each other on mountainsides, though we will, to protect our land. But we would prefer not to be doing that any more than we have to. So the message is, please just stop lighting fires in the countryside. We have to stop lighting fires. Crews will remain here on and off for a couple of days. But this fire has now been dealt with. Hey guys, still on it at your age? But another wildfire started yeah. by a good citizen, like almost all fires, okay. is only one match strike away. Mm -hmm. uh, Brian, make the callers aware that uh, BBC are here filming in the tactical command room. At Ambulance Control Centre, the daily briefing. Assistant Director John Wright is in the chair. Everything appears routine, but then comes an indication of how the backdrop has changed. Understand completely, yes. As we film, crew are phoning in reporting symptoms of COVID-19. So no, where are you located? Beast. There's a 44. Okay. I know, Gary, of course. Up. It's just worrying for you, but it's not too. That's a couple of calls Tracy's taken from our staff. So they're both reporting um, being potentially symptomatic for COVID. How have you been able to cope? If our staff ring in, we can we can give them support very very quickly. They'll be contacted by our, our, our swab testing team, and an arrangement will be made to test them for the virus. Do you know how many of your staff have tested positive? Let me just check. We've tested over 300 uh, staff and households. 30 of our staff have tested positive. Um, I think we've had a couple hospitalised actually, but they're they've both recovered. You actually have staff right now, don't you, who you've, who've had to leave their home? Oh yes, we've got four, 41 people in accommodation at the minute. Sometimes it's because they're symptomatic, and sometimes it's because they have vulnerable members of their household, you know, their families, and they don't want to go to work and then potentially bring COVID back to the house. On this day, a total of 110 crew members are absent, mostly self-isolating, not ill, due to COVID-19 but the ambulance service has learned to cope with reduced numbers. So on this screen here, what we're looking at is our COVID response monitoring report. So this is completed every day. And you'll see it's the, the type of calls coming in and how many of them. And then at the bottom, you'll see here where we have mapped our COVID calls. So we had one call back in January the 23rd, which was the first case in Northern Ireland. January the 23rd? Yeah, it was the first case in Northern Ireland. Uh, right up until where there was a peak on the 6th of April was our peak and we had six, 269 calls in that day relating to COVID. COVID. Yep. And if your calls had, had, had uh, continued to, to kind of take in the, the, the normal type of accidents, yeah. would you have been able to cope, do you think? It, it certainly would have been a, 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 a strain. It certainly would have been under huge pressure. If people, certainly, if people to... hadn't have done what they were asked to do, we certainly would, would have been in a different position today. There's no doubt about that. The coronavirus outbreak hasn't overwhelmed the ambulance service. The lockdown brought a reduction in the normal rate of accidents at work or on the road, which is a good thing because the crews are still very busy. We're filming weeks after the reported peak of the impact of the virus but their work never stops. Jess and I are, are currently a crew. You just get into a routine and you don't have to ask your crewmate for something that you need, you know that way. I think it makes it easier during all this. Yeah. <laughs> Is that 
all you got. <laughs> Don't want to get stopped by. <laughs> I think it helps as well because you're not working with like loads of random people. If I know I'm coming into Orla, Aww. and I obviously know like she's not out like, gallivanting and. It reduces your exposure, I suppose, is what we're saying. Yeah, like I know that Orla's going home to her partner and I'm going home to mine. And neither of us are... Performing non-essential journeys. Performing non-essential journeys. <laughs> so we would work together on every shift unless one of us is off on leave or off sick with COVID. Yeah. That was hard times. Orla had to deal without me for seven days. Didn't like it. At the peak of the pandemic, Jessica tested positive for the virus. You've had COVID-19, yeah? Yeah. What was it like for you? Um, it wasn't too bad. I was very lucky. Um, all very mild, apart from extreme hardness um, and loss of smell and taste. I was, I had no cough, no real fever. Um, but but, but the fact that you've recovered, does that make you feel it doesn't make me feel invincible. So. Invincible or anything now? No, 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 no. People will joke about it and say, oh, you're grand, you'll not get it again, but you always have that in the back of your mind that it's maybe still, it can lie dormant and then come back again. Jessica was off for seven days. Orla, yeah. as a crew partner, was at risk, but she didn't show any symptoms. I have had nothing. Of course, that doesn't mean you haven't had it. No. Because you, you haven't been tested. Mm hmm would you have wanted to be tested? Um, probably an element of me would have, yes, just to know one way or the other. Did you ask to get tested? I had phoned our silver command and following guidelines that are in place, we get tested if we're symptomatic, which at that time I wasn't. So I didn't get tested. The ambulance service say their policy is based on guidance from the public health agency and it is under continuing review. Like all the emergency services, the PSNI had drawn up plans to deal with the pandemic. Their day-to-day -day response is run from their Belfast headquarters. Chief Inspector Jerry McGrath is in charge today. So what's this here? This is the COVID-19 silver cell. Um, everything that comes in the police service in Northern Ireland that has a COVID-19 element comes through this hub. You're in contact with every single police unit across Northern Ireland right now? We have the ability to reach out and touch any single officer anywhere in Northern Ireland so we can move them around a bit like a chessboard, the right resource, the right area. Over the period of the crisis, the police seem to have moderated their enforcement of the lockdown rules. But as we listen into a phone conference, a new twist the prospect of organised protests against the lockdown. As regards the Clan Mark Gallery? Yes, there, um, there is some information we've received about potential mass gatherings and that is being researched as we speak. Um, we were going to review what our policing tone and style will be uh, should indeed that take place. Thanks very much. Here's all Thank you. One of the callers that raised what people have been seeing on social media, this, the prospect of some sort of gathering, a protest of some sort, that, that clearly would raise issues for you. I think this could be the first challenge that this office will have had in relation to a mass gathering that will be openly, potentially openly and frequently breaching the regulations. And the public have a right to expect us to protect them from these people who may seek to protest lawfully. Um, and that will be a real challenge for all of us. You were accused, your colleagues were accused of being overzealous at the start of policing people in parks. The Department of Health created these regulations and enabled us to be the enforcer of them. I can understand people's perceptions around a police officer asking them to move on. And I can understand how someone would see that as overzealous. It's a tricky one, isn't it? Let's see what tomorrow brings. Social media trumpets two mass demonstrations for Saturday the 16th of May. One doesn't happen. The other happens, sort of, in Belfast's Ormo Park. And also exercising our freedom of speech. Do we still have freedom of speech? Do we still have freedom of speech? Where are people's human rights and civil liberties being stripped? It's a small gathering, around 20 people. Here is individuals opposed to lockdown rules. Some also worried about vaccines and the alleged influence of Bill Gates, but they're not organised. In fairness, even they themselves seem to be keeping the social distancing guidelines. It's 
It's unsure what the police are going to do now. We know that they haven't handed out any tickets yet. They haven't really taken any particular action. I don't think there's going to be need for any major policing operation here today. Anti-racism rallies are due to take place in Belfast and Londonderry today, despite appeals by police for them to be called off. The BSNI has warned that mass gatherings pose a public health risk during the coronavirus pandemic. A few weeks later, another demonstration in Belfast in connection with the Black Lives Matter movement would prove a more difficult proposition for the police and all those attending. I applaud all those whose presence here is echoing the warning. We will not sit back in silence. The police had warned organisers that the demonstration was in breach of lockdown rules and that they would be subject to sanctions. On the day, the organisers make transparent efforts to preserve safe social distancing, marking out where people should stand, and those attending pay attention to them. So far, so very peaceful. No problems whatsoever. A lot of police around the perimeter, but no sense of any drama. The police standing by while the demonstrators are maintaining social distancing. An hour after it starts, the demonstration ends. The police had allowed it to go ahead, but as people are leaving, it's now clear that they are issuing fines and cautions. I practiced my social distancing. I did everything that I was supposed to do. I told people. And they came up and they were like, okay, well, can we please take your information? If you, if you, if you don't give our, your information, it's going to be obstruction. So why is it going to be obstruction if we don't give our names and we're going to get arrested for that? We're going to go up to, where was it, Musgrave? Musgrave's some sort of suite. As police attempt to caution one man, bystanders gather around. Do you get what, do you understand where I'm coming from? Do you understand where I'm coming from? I can't give you my personal opinion. Because you know what's right and what's wrong, but you're not going to speak to us right and wrong because you weren't that. If I was speaking to you as a human being. This standoff develops into what appears to be the biggest breach of social distancing rules this afternoon. No, no, you need to change. You need to change. The confrontation ends when the police decide not to caution and walk away. The organisers had been warned that they faced being fined, and that's what happened, as one steward explains. Where are people getting tickets? Yes, I got a ticket, £60. Pounds. Um, what did it say? For what exactly? Um, I think it's breaching the co something about COVID. They came up to me after the protest. They had been watching um, me trying to disperse the crowds. Um, came up and said that they were given orders to give stewards um, tickets specifically for organizing this event. 14 protesters were fined or cautioned. Another 56 people were sanctioned at a sister demonstration in Derry. The police said they were simply enforcing the health regulations which were designed to save lives. All told, the PSNI has issued more than 1,200 fines or cautions for breaches of the lockdown rules. We're back with our paramedics, Orla and Jessica, for an overnight shift. 12 long hours ahead. 87 year old breathing problems. COVID-19 looms with the first call, an elderly woman afraid she has the symptoms. Completely up to you, Belly. You're obviously anxious about going to hospital because you, you have been self-isolating. Your chest sounds clear. Your breathing has settled quite a bit since we've arrived. And I'm keeping you back. Don't be worried about that, Belly. We're here for you. The crew supply reassurance and personal contact, all the medicine this patient needs. A lovely, lovely woman. Lady woman. Yeah. Probably more a, a social. Yeah, I think she's more, um, she doesn't have any family. Um, she's been isolating for 40 days, I think 40 she days said. on her own. And I think there's maybe a wee bit of anxiety. 
um, because she settled straight away when we arrived. And she thought she, she was worried about COVID-19? That's why she's not really wanting to go in the hospital, um, because she's worried of, of getting it in hospital. Yeah, I suppose going to hospital would put her at a higher risk because of her age. She's 87, although a very fit 87. Um, but she knows herself, it's better to stay home. Their shift is underway with the best possible outcome. But this night will only get more challenging. Ulster to the Royal. A patient is critically ill. The crew need to move him if there's to be any chance of keeping him alive. This latest call was an emergency transfer from the Ulster Hospital in Dundonald here to the Royal Hospital to the intensive care unit. A patient fighting for their life, the crew doing their very best to help. Like so many of their calls, they are told that their patient, terribly ill, also has symptoms of COVID-19. Another deep clean, and their ambulance is taken out of action for another 30 minutes. Yes, there's um, no cleaning crews after 10 p.m., so night shifts you generally clean the vehicle yourself. Because the vast majority of us took the lockdown instructions seriously, the ambulance service was able to cope but the crew are concerned about what might happen next. If you had a message for the public out there who are thinking maybe of taking liberties with whatever new freedoms are, roll out, are rolled out over the next couple of weeks, what would you say to them? If you're not well, then you need to stay at home. You need to protect yourself and you need to protect your family and others. You know, we don't want this spiking again. I think at the moment we're dealing with it fairly well and we don't need to, to add the extra pressures if lockdown is, is eased. Yeah. Stay at home, save lives, protect the NHS, isn't that the tagline? That's it. Emergency with Travis. I just heard the emergency operator. Do you need fire, police or ambulance? Police, thank you. Darkness is falling as you meet Gavin and his police colleagues on the outskirts of Lisburn. Hiya, sir. Right. Do you have a driving licence on yeah. you? Sure. We're just stopping and speaking to people just as regards asking them what has them out in the roads today. What has you guys out? So we're just in a, a checkpoint here at the moment, just checking to see what people are out doing. Just really trying to enforce the, the current legislation, the lockdown, making sure everybody, their, their journey is essential, what they're doing, and if not, trying to educate them as to what they should be doing or, or why they shouldn't be out. Yeah. We're a minute. It's all very ordinary until it isn't. Suddenly, Gavin is wanted. So we're actually being called over. Patrol? So they stopped this car at the checkpoint. One of the officers thought they could detect some cannabis, some marijuana. The driver is taken aside while his details are checked and a fingertip search of the car begins. Gentlemen, I've been told he's going to be searched, him in the vehicle under section 23. Just a misuse of drugs act um, and see if we can find anything. He did seem quite nervous. Smell in that car, there's bound to be something in there. Even noticeable through the mask, so. Where do you look? Looked in the driver's side, there's nothing on him. You find it in the wee, the wee larches and under the spur wheels and the like, but sometimes it can just be sitting there. It's still all clear as the search reaches the boot. I think this might be it. Oh dear. Gavin, want to stick cuffs on him? There we go. It's definitely an interest that I would have was getting drugs off the streets. I think drugs cause so much harm to people's lives. 
very, very sort of ballpark. There's probably three or four hundred pounds worth of cannabis there. So what's going to happen to the driver now? Danielle's going to arrest him for possession of Class B and possession of Class B with intent to supply, just based on that quantity. The computer check on the driver comes back positive for the police. So the, the driver has now been arrested. Turns out he's wanted for a variety of crimes, alleged crimes, in the Belfast area, as well as having been found with several hundred pounds worth of marijuana on him. I'm going to arrest you for a couple of offences here, OK? So you're going to be arrested for possession of a Class B controlled drug, OK? You're going to be arrested for possession of a Class B controlled drug with intent to supply. No, let me just do this first, and then you can tell me, OK? It's grand, because there's a few to get through here. You're going to be arrested for one count of burglary. You're under arrest for one count of threats to kill, one count of common assault. I'm going to further arrest you for possession of an offensive weapon in a public place, times two. I'm going to caution you for all those offences and we'll get down to custody. See, when you get to custody, you can bring anyone. Are you displaying any symptoms or signs of COVID? Yeah. Yeah? I'll we'll have to take you to a special COVID suite then in custody, all right? No, all right, be honest. No, you're only joking, right? OK. The driver, now a suspect, has a long night ahead of him. While the suspect is processed, his suspected contraband bagged for technical examination, other people are still arriving, some with apparent symptoms of COVID-19. These cases have led to new protocols in the custody suites. Once we establish that there is a possibility that someone has COVID, we'll keep them outside the vehicle dock. The nurse will go out and do checks. And if somebody has got a high temperature or, or the persistent cough, then we'll call the nurse out straight away to try and prevent it going further into the custody suite. So we've just been told that the police have uh, pulled up with somebody in the back of the car who they've arrested and who they believe is showing symptoms of COVID-19. If the person is confirmed COVID-19, we'll go up the stairs to the isolation wing up the stairs. Turns out the temperature test came back okay, so the prisoner is going to be processed normally. Around 40 firefighters are continuing to tackle a large grassland fire at a nature reserve in the docks area of North Belfast. Large plumes of smoke have been generated by the blaze and anyone living nearby is being advised to keep their doors and windows closed. Another sunny day in lockdown, another large gorse fire. Assistant Commissioner Aidan Jennings brings us up to speed. Can you tell us about the fire at the moment? Yeah, so we've a wildland fire, gorse fire burning, uh, across sort of on the old dump site. We have a hazmat officer in, uh, because of potential risk with the, the old dump site, methane gas. So there's methane gas sitting underneath it. What about the motorway over here? Because we're seeing that that smoke is drifting right across. Yeah, so there's smoke drifting right across and up towards Napoleon's nose. It can't be saying warnings are up and traffic's being slowed on the M2 at this stage. This fire has one very serious potential hazard. As a former landfill site, it may have underground pockets of flammable methane gas. Firefighters have to factor in this additional risk. Belfast city centre is about a mile that way. And here it's like a, a scene from the apocalypse. Uh, there's dozens of acres of land have been burnt through. Smoke billowing across the city. Very challenging conditions, very warm. Uh, there's a significant area. Uh, if you look back and see the fire plants in the hill, we walked from that and at least as far the other side of that. So we're probably two, two and a half kilometres around to the lock shore. It really looks like a fire front there, yeah, doesn't it? Yeah, and you can see it, you can follow the heavy smoke right around there on the horizon again. 
smouldering ground reignites in a matter of seconds. The only sure way to put down the fire is water. Fire engines ferry it from the tide line on Belfast Lock. So at present, the fire plants are going up and down to the high volume pump. It's pumping from Belfast Lock and filling those up in a, in a shovel. And then the plants are coming up with 1,800 litres of water on board each time. Crews don't have a lot of time. As the tide goes out, they'll lose their ready supply. The tide's going out, but our high volume pump's set in. So as the tide goes out, we'll start to lose that head of water. That'll make it more difficult for us to get water on the far ground here. It really looks like something of a nightmare. The trails of smoke, as far as the eye can see, across the cave hill. The ground all burnt out. You're just struck by the, by the waste of it all. There's dozens of acres of land here that's been burnt out. There's wee nesting birds have, have died, dozens of them, no doubt. Firefighters have said they've come across them. An entire ecosystem has been destroyed in this nature reserve. One firefighter shows us a photo of a meadow pipit chick he rescued from the flames. It's a species that's listed as under threat. Newly hatched chicks and scores of small mammals were unable to escape the fast moving blaze. Just what a waste and almost certainly started by human activity. Just no point to this, this wanton destruction. Over the last couple of weeks, with the spate of wildfires, the fire service have all but begged people to take care of the countryside. And then you have something like this. Back at their base, a break for Orla and Jessica. Their overnight shift is almost ended. The thing that I think has struck us most of all is the way COVID-19 kind of haunts your, your work at the moment. It is literally every other call since we've been with you that you've had a COVID-19 suspected symptoms patient. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The ambulance has spent an awful lot of time in deep clean. Yeah. So it's, it is kind of haunting you, isn't it? Every shift. Probably will be for a long time. Yeah. Another emergency call. Telehave. Back on the road. One last call. This couldn't be more different than the first of the night. We actually need to go now. They are hurrying to a care home. A resident diagnosed with COVID-19 is in serious trouble. Every time, first the personal protection kit then the rush to try and save a life. This sort of emergency can only end two ways, with good news or dreadful news. It's 
just gone seven o'clock in the morning and the crew are in attendance at a care home not too far away and the patient they've been working with has died. She's elderly, a woman, and she had COVID-19. Did you know pretty quickly that there wasn't much chance for her? Yeah. I would say we probably did, but you still have to give everyone the best possible care that you can. And treating that individual as a, a member of your family, the, how you would want a member of your family to be treated, yeah. with dignity and respect, and I believe that that's what Jessica and myself did. Uh, how does that affect you when you go out in the job, and something like that happens? I suppose it's a call that you're just trained to, to go and just do, just when they're sort of like autopilot. And we'll maybe reflect on it tonight when we come back in and say to each other, you know why you are right, checking on each other. Yeah. And make sure that, that we've dealt with it as best we can. As the lockdown eases, crime is rising again, including assaults on ambulance crews. Seven days ago, Orla and Jessica were attacked by someone they were trying to help. They were left shaken, but otherwise unhurt. The pandemic has brought huge challenges for the emergency services. Though not without some difficulties, they have been able to cope. But for them and for all of us, there is a new norm and there is no end date in sight.